Hi guys and welcome to this week's BartenderHQ.com podcast and on this week's show I have a very, very special guest. I'm joined this week by Russell Davis from Bar Rescue over in the States. Um, he's a former Bartender of the Year with the Nightclub and Bar Show and has won numerous awards. He has his own consultancy business uh, called Unlimited Liabilities and uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation with him. So let's get right on with it. Welcome to the BartenderHQ.com podcast. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at BartenderHQ. Here's your host, David Scooby Sangwell. Hi guys and welcome to BartenderHQ.com podcast. And joining me today is Russell Davis from Bar, T- uh, from Bar Rescue over in the States. Uh, hi Russell. How's it going, David? Um, and I'm delighted to have him joining me today. Uh, we just kind of caught up on uh, Twitter, I think. We were just uh, chatting yeah. about some stuff, and <laughs> and yeah. here we are. I you're reaching out, actually. It's really uh, great. I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's just nice to be doing uh, doing something in a time when people even want to talk to you about what you do. Yeah, man, definitely. <laughs> um, and I mean, I only got into Bar Rescue probably about a month ago. I think I've watched them all now. Awesome. Um, so I'm up to date. Um, but yeah, uh, just first and foremost, do you want to just uh, give everyone a bit of an idea of your background and how you got into bartending and to where you are now? Yeah, it uh, goes pretty far back. I I, uh, I got into bartending, I always had a love for the, the, the movie Cocktail, uh, even in, in high school. Um, and I got into bartending uh, back uh, in college, and it was um, a way to pay for college. And also, I, I, I would sit in my dorm room and learn all the tricks from cocktail. Uh, but I bartended in Austin for, for many, many years. Um, I learned on 6th Street, and actually what a lot of ha- people don't realize is 6th Street in Austin after Hurricane Katrina. Um, originally, it was Bourbon Street that has more bars, nightclubs, and restaurants per capita in the U.S., but... Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, it actually switched over to Austin. So Sixth Street became a very – it was already a very iconic bar and legendary bar street, but it became a very crazy town right after that, and I was bartending in that that time frame. Uh, and so uh, I did that for many years. Um, it's interesting because the industry is – I've left the industry three times and come back to it. Uh, you know, it always came, called me back and then I'm glad it did this last time. <laughs> uh, but then, um, what I ended up doing was really kind of sticking with it, focusing on being able to do a showmanship style bartending. Um, I, I don't really, you know, flair is definitely a word, but I'm not the same style flair that you see a lot of other people do. Uh, and I, and I don't want to say working flair because I feel like the term working flair is almost overused. Um, but it's definitely a style of showmanship bartending that I, I, I mix with speed. And then I, I, when the mixology kind of movement started happening, I, I really kind of grabbed that bull by the horns. Um, so in 2010 and 2011, I was ranked top three in the country with the nightclub and bar organization. Um, and then in 2012, I actually won bartender of the year and I got moved out from, uh, Texas to San Francisco to bourbon and branch and to Rick house. Um, and in Rick House, I was there when I was in 2011 and then 2012. So in 2012, I actually won um, Bartender of the Year at Rick House. And then Rick House, we won Top High Volume Cocktail Bar awesome. Uh, awesome. in the world that tells the cocktail. Yeah, so it was one of those. They actually, we won the first award ever for Top High Volume Cocktail Bar. Um, so it was kind of cool. Uh and so it was really just nice because there was a lot of really cool stuff going on. You know, we were in San, was in San Francisco, and you could just feel this this energy of the industry, and you could feel these, uh, you know, these rock stars being made out of certain people from around the world, really. <laughs> and you could start seeing them kind of come up, and then you had the the mentors, and and luckily I was in this generation, which bartender generations are very different than the rest of the generations because we have a much shorter lifespan as far as professionally, but. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was, really, I was really lucky. So, um, so yeah, man, uh, uh, I, I took that and went into Bar Rescue, got uh, pulled into Bar Rescue, um, and have done that. Uh, just got done filming my 16th, 17th episode. Uh, got to film a couple more, and then, um, yeah, and then I've got a lot of other stuff in the works, including a, a space project uh, where I'm creating, I'm on a team of experts creating the first uh, 
cocktail glass, uh, first cocktail and drink mixing mechanism to be in zero gravity for essentially the space hospitality yeah. industry. Um, yeah, and then uh, uh, my consulting company, Unlimited Liabilities, I've expanded, um, got some great people underneath me, including my VP of Projects, who's Kate Gerwin, the first uh, female champion, world champion bartender ever. Awesome. Uh, yeah, and so we're just kind of rocking and rolling, man, trying to, to elevate bartending and take this, uh, you know, being a being a hooker was the world's oldest profession, being a bartender was the second, and I want to elevate <laughs> to a level it's never been, you know? Yeah, definitely. Now, I, I want to talk about this cocktails in space thing, right? Because I, I saw this on Facebook, I guess, yesterday, the day before. Uh, it's not been out there for too long, I don't think. Um, but I had no idea it was anything to do with you until, like, later that day, and then I was like, oh, there's Russ. Um, so I was like, oh, cool. That's something else we can have a chat about. So, um, yeah, I, I, I see this thing and it's going to have a valve in the bottom and you basically, I, I guess you're going to put a pouch onto there, are you, of the drink? Or? Well, what, what's, you know, what it was was originally we've been working on the project for three years. Okay. Uh, it was, I had met these guys that had built a robot called Cosmobot that was right. a Barth robot. Uh, I, had, I had to compete against them in 2000 and I can't remember if it was 2011 or 2012, but I had to compete against them in a humans versus robot bartender competition at Portland, and, right. uh, Portland Cocktail Week. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, after the competition, we kind of got together because, you know, we were the kind of champions of it. And we, we looked at each other and they were like, you know, you want to do the first cocktail for space? And I was like, you know, hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, you know? I was already a little lit up by then. You know, anybody says that at that point, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, but then getting to know them and figuring out, oh crap, these guys are serious and that they had the expertise to do it, not just the expertise, but were actually tied in the space industry. Yeah. Uh, very much so. Uh, yeah. So we just kept on rolling with it. And then it got to a point where we realized that this, this glass was almost significant and symbolic of a larger company and not just symbolic of the company, but also what was a great celebration of what the last frontier for mankind is, you know? And, and so we're, we, we've launched a larger company called the Cosmic Lifestyle Corporation, what ultimately I'm the CEO of now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm on these Skype calls with these guys that are rocket scientists and astronauts and, and, very, and, and, the, and the, the founders of the Front, Space Frontier Foundations. And I'm just thinking, you know, I'm the bartender mixologist just thinking, don't say anything stupid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we designed this glass that's kind of the symbol of the project, which utilizes the physics of first it's 3d printed which mm -hmm. is very much a uh the way that the space industry is going yeah uh, now a lot of people don't realize that space tourism is a huge thing right now mm. uh, you know there's virgin galactic has been spending charging a quarter of a million dollar tickets and they've already sold well over seven or eight hundred tickets for virgin galactic already um you know you have elon musk you have multiple other people within different companies, SpaceX, uh, Bigelow Industries that are creating things that are space hotels, ways to, to get to space that are now privately funded and privately done. Um, space is now a private industry. It's a $315 billion a year industry. And we are trying to use this to capture the hospitality industry of what space is because not only is it going to apply to the space tourists, but it's going to apply to the space cons private consumers that are the workers there. And they're going to need, quite frankly, an easier, more enjoyable way to live for extended periods of time. Now, 3D printing, we just put the first 3D printer on the International Space Station. So in the future, factories are going to be built using 3D printing. They're going to have 3D printing factories that will build everything to do in space. We're not going to take things to space. Mm. We're going to send a file and then print it in space. Um, and that's the future. So we're using that technology in order to build this. And then what we've done is we've also used the physics of surface tension, um, basically with the same thing as like the meniscus of liquids. Yeah, yeah. And created these angles that uses an angle in, in physics called uh, the wetting angle. Now, the certain degree of this angle in zero gravity will draw liquids and carry them um, uh, uh, just over, over the course of this angle, you, almost like a pipeline, yeah. uh, nonstop in zero gravity, just by the physics of it. It naturally, utilizing the surface tension, the, it's called a capillary action of this wetting angle, draws the liquids. So all of the grooves that we've created in this glass is trying to create that terra experience for the consumer 
so that we're able to hold liquids in this glass without a top so you can still smell it. And yet the liquids are being drawn to the side in zero gravity and it won't spill out. And luckily we got the first, um, one of the first prototypes on a zero gravity parabolic flight in Japan in that called Ast uh, for a company called Astrax. And we were able to prove that the initial physics and everything of the glass works with water. <laughs> so uh, now we're, we're, we're actually in the process of uh, talking to some liquor brands. And, and um, we, are in, we are in talks with one specifically, but uh, uh, that we will be creating what's essentially the first cocktail mixed in space. That's pretty awesome. I mean, I've I got to say that the first thing that I want to see is you flaring on one of these parabolic flights. Uh, zero G flare is going to be something uh, that's going to be all completely so, new moves. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> You're never going to drop anything. Um, but yeah, I mean, that sounds awesome. And, and if you guys, if you've not seen this at home, um, you, you need to have a quick look. I'll put the link into the show notes. But basically, you've got a martini glass with grooves into the top of it. And and the way that it works is kind of like half of a straw. But the the surface tension kind of completes the straw. Is that, that That's kind of the very basic way of well, sort yeah. of talking yeah, about it. Yeah, the surface tension keeps it in. And then mm -hmm. the wetting angle with the capillary action draws it up that that ain't that that groove like a straw you know it's yeah, essentially yeah. it's 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 crazy that we're even able to do this and to even think that this is our reality right now is pretty amazing these are the big problems of space how do i have a martini <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that that's really awesome and uh it's it does just sort of blow your mind. It's like, well, this year's uh, Back to the Future year, right? This is this yeah. is when we go to in Back to the Future. So why not? Um... Space and tea is going to be huge this year. <laughs> Space and tea. <laughs> cool, man. Um, so, yeah, uh, with Bar Rescue, um, so you were in there right from the first season, right? No, I, no? I actually got brought on to Bar Rescue on uh, season three. Okay. Um, and uh, but now I've become the the expert. That's pretty much I, I've done. I've done most most of the expo, uh, episodes. Uh, I'm the ringer of sorts. So I'm yeah. the kind of guy yeah. you, you bring in for the tough ones. So. Cool, no worries. And what's your favorite bar? What's that? What's the favorite bar that you've actually worked on and rescued? You know, I, I can't say that I have a, a favorite favorite because they each you know each one of the families, one of the staffs, they've resonated differently. Um, some of them not so much. Unfortunately, sometimes you walk away and, and you've helped someone, but it's not always, uh, you know, the right person, mm -hmm. you know, per se. But uh, you always feel good about trying to help someone and dig them out of that kind of situation. Yeah, um, and yeah. sometimes you really connect it with the staff to where you're, you know, they become like a second family to you. And there's a few of them for me that's been that way, but particularly one has been the Jack's Fire Department episode. Mm -hmm. uh, those three brothers were just amazing guys. The entire family was amazing. Um, I still, you know, the daughter, uh, Catherine, is a good friend. I text her. And we, we text back and forth just uh, uh, just keeping in contact, and she's kind of like my pulse into the family still. And Brian McGowan and Chris and, and, and the whole family, mm -hmm. uh, actually. And, and, and uh, I ended up even staying with them for a couple of days after the, uh, the show was uh, filmed and everything just because they're just such good people, and it was really – you know, we we took a fire truck and we chopped that bad boy up, <laughs> and we put a you know put the, the the front of a fire truck on the back bar, and that was the entire place looked great. We felt good about everything. The family were amazing people, uh, and it was it was it was really just that one felt great. That was that one felt really good, uh, and especially because there were three firefighters. You know, Brian had had he was really a hero. He'd been awarded for. For taking for getting two babies out of a fire, Whoa. you know. So these were, you know, these weren't bad people. They just didn't know how to operate the bar then. Yeah, yeah. No, there's there's sort of two different camps. Well, there's more than that even on Bar Rescue, where you've got the guys that kind of don't care that it's such a state. Some of them, and and then there's others where they're really struggling and really fighting to try and get it working but they just don't have the knowledge and it's it's really weird like you really root for some of the guys and then others you're just like just leave <laughs> just leave them to it <laughs> i think to the root of that is that you know i think deep down that no one really doesn't care 
Mm. Very rarely does someone really not care. I feel like the not caring is more of a defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And so I try to see through that. And to me, that's what motivates me because I have to keep myself motivated too. Mm-hmm. You know, I, have, I try to put my heart into it. And so to keep my heart into it, I, I try to, you know, if, it, if I ever thought that they didn't care, it'd be really hard for me to keep my heart into it. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's thinking of it as the defense mechanism, um, which, is, which is understandable, but it's, it's, it's breaking through that that's the, the tough part. But John's really great at doing that. So. Oh, I know, yeah. I mean, do, how, what's your kind of relationship with the other experts on the show? Do you uh, end up meeting up with the other guys that, I mean, the other bar experts, for example? Do you guys yeah. have like an end of season rap party or you get together we actually need to you know the weird <laughs> thing is, is i don't think we've ever had an end of a season <laughs> when it, it, it seems like every time we get to an end of a season that you know people love the show and so mm. we end up keep on going <laughs> so uh we have even though it might say the end of the season i think we're still filming into the next uh, sometimes mm. um you know the the other experts, some of them I, I have not met before. Um, some of them I have uh, pretty decent, pretty great relationships with, actually. Um, and then uh, um, a couple of them I actually do a lot of work with. Uh, Kate Gerwin specifically, she is the VP of projects for my company in the liabilities. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So some of them, um, you know, it just, it just depends. There've been so many of them now that uh, uh, I haven't. I can't remember specifically some of the ones that there are some of them that I I definitely just can't remember bring ring a bell uh, offhand. Um, but yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them I definitely have close relationships with. But I, I, I Kate Gerwin specifically, she's the first female world champion bartender, and, and her and I have been great friends for a long time. Um, and I've also, you know, the the production company that casts Bar Rescue is called Metal Flowers Media. Um, and I work with them to try to help them find people. So sometimes I'm able to bring them uh, experts to the table and stuff. Awesome. 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 Yeah. I did notice actually on your Facebook page that you teased a bit of a project with Chef Brian Duffy. Uh, oh, well, we were in January. Know, Duffy and I have always played around. <laughs> we, we just, uh, well, um, you know, Duffy and Duffy's. <laughs> Duffy and I are really good friends. We're the guys that when we were filming Bar Rescue together, we would take, you know, we have that one day, that 36 hours where we have basically off-site training and then we mm-hmm. have, up, you know, 20 hours to ourselves, 24 hours to ourselves <laughs> as they're doing the renovations. And um, Duffy and I would use that time to absolutely destroy towns, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> We just, you know, just have a great time, just bar hopping and just, you know, whenever Bar Rescue would come to these towns too, it's like the circus comes to town. Yeah, well, I, I showing up, we just, you know, shake up and everything. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I know what you consultants are like, actually. I opened a bar in uh, Dubai a few years oh. back uh, on the Palm, and we had a guy with us called Andrew Mullins. Who, uh, yeah. you know, Andrew? I've I've heard the name. Yeah, Andrew. yeah, he's a absolutely outstanding. Um, consultant and and the stuff that we put together, we were doing you know molecular stuff, we were doing foams, we were doing all all kinds of stuff. Um, but uh, the well, amount the guy is amazing market. Too. Yeah, yeah. But but I mean, this guy when he got together with the uh, the sommelier for the for the hotel, these guys just ripped the place up. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how it is. Work hard, play hard. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, some superb times. Um, so yeah, that that was really cool. But uh, I'm glad to hear that you guys uh, get to party a bit as well while you're over there. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, you know, as far as a project together, um, we we just can't seem to line up our schedules and everything. It's it seems like we're just so busy that we just can't, you know, get it to happen or get it. it just nothing's. It's not that we're against it, and we're always open to something, but nothing has kind of seen, you know, made its way out there yet. No, it'd be, it'd be great to see you guys get something together and uh, working we know, on... <laughs> we keep on telling each other that, that we need to do something. Now, I, I, I do have something that I'm talking to um, Ryan Scott from Top Chef about, uh, mm-hmm. that we might pair up and do something in L.A. It's It's... You know, we're just now beginning to talk about it. I'm not even sure if I should be saying this now, but, you know, we're looking at doing something. Uh, we're, we might start casting some, uh, you know, a lot of times what I found out now would, would, is a great thing to do with social media that just kind of changed the game of this industry. Is mm-hmm. Sometimes it's great just to cast uh, lines out there and see what you pull back. Uh, and, and that's what I think what we're going to do with Ryan, you know, see yeah. what the interest is out there. 
Cool. Well, I mean, this is just between us anyway. Nobody else is going to hear <laughs> this, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I won't tell anyone. <laughs> um, I have a few questions that I kind of ask every bartender that I interview uh, on here, so uh, I hope you'll humour humor me with these. Um, so, the first one is, uh, when you walk into a bar, what is the drink that you order to kind of gauge the level of the bartenders there, if it's not a bar that you've been to before? You know, I'm always one of these guys that I'll 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 sit back and look at the bar first. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll walk back and I I, I try to know my surroundings. Um, so I would like to say that an easy, really basic go to these days is an old fashioned. Mm-hmm. You know, old fashioned can tell you things from regionally where you are to what level. I mean, from the spirit that's going into it, what level of, of, of well they have there to, you know, whether or not they're going at muddling sh- cherries and oranges in it, or if they're stirring it with bitter sugar and doing the lemon peel and the orange peel, you know, topping it with so, Coke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, so to me, and if you think about old fashioned, you know, I mean, it's an old fashioned in the oldest fashion style of cocktail from the yeah. 18th six version of the definition of a cocktail. So, to me, that should be really the go-to. And everybody's heard of an old-fashioned. So, you know, you can walk into a dive bar and, and see what level of even kind of dive bar they are by their old-fashioned, you know. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, there are, there are great dive bars these days that can make, that will sit there and hand crack a, an ice cube off a block and then hand stir it and, 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 and make it the, the correct old-fashioned way. And actually, it was Ice and Lewis Bags on uh, Twitter that got us chalking. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. You guys saw me doing the light, the loose bag. Yeah, because you were talking about uh, actually it was cocktails in the old fashioned style, wasn't it? On on that last bar rescue that you featured on so far this season. So yeah, I got a I got a lot of flack on that. Uh, really? Actually, which was interesting because you know it just it's interesting how many people are miseducated about cocktails, mm-hmm. um, especially in the U.S. You know, it was. I pretty much pulled the rug out on the whole cherry being in an old fashioned and it's true old fashioned <laughs> sense. Um, and then you have a lot of people do social media attack you to Twitter. And I don't, I'm not one of these people that, that lets it get to me or answers back to everything. You know, you kind of have to compartmentalize it, but I did do one post. I was like, Hey guys, just to let you know, circa 1806 old fashioned is actually no cherry. Sans cherry, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's just interesting to see everybody's reaction because they've been, Unfortunately, it's become something so different than what it really was. Mm. How married they get to that idea that when you even shake things up by telling them the truth and on a cocktail, how much it ruffles their flat feathers. It was very, very interesting to see that for me. I hadn't, you know, I've taught a lot of truths on Bar Rescue, but I don't think that I pulled the rug on a lot of truths and I, I <laughs> or, <laughs> on, you know, on, on not truths. And, and that time I did. No, no, that's that's all good. It's it's great when you start being a bit more controversial. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I didn't look at it as controversial to me. No, no. <laughs> I mean, the yeah, way we do it. Although I, I kind of, uh, I learned the majority of my cocktails with Fridays, mm-hmm. um, which is one of the better places in the UK to learn it, at least, yeah. or, or was when I was learning. Uh, they still do some great stuff, but there we, it was orange and, orange and a cherry, muddle it. And, yeah, but, you uh, know, and, and, and it's weird because it was, it was that, that, even regionally, that the way that came out was through basically Wisconsin. You know, they were drinking a brandy old fashioned with a new mm-hmm. brand and they mull it and soda and soda and everything. And I'm very much one of these people that's acceptable that if it's the standard that everybody thinks it is, that can be the standard. Yeah. yeah. But um, you know, to me, it's it's there definitely very much. Uh, I want to tell people, hey, look, you know, that's that's definitely a version of an old fashioned. But if we're talking about, especially with the drink name being as ironic as it is the old-fashioned, you know, <laughs> let's, let's really talk about <laughs> what the real recipe is, you know. No worries. Uh, right, and the next one on my, um, my automatic uh, questions list is, if you could sit at any bar in the world right now, where would it be? Uh, El Florida in Cuba. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never been there. Okay. Um, it's it's such a legendary bar in mm. my mind. Uh, and the, the Hemingway, I'm such a Hemingway fan. And Constantino, the legendary bartender, uh, to me, 
you know, so I, I, one of my favorite books was And a Bottle of Rum by, by uh, uh, Wayne Curtis. And okay. he would talk about Constantino and how, you know, I, I, my secret, like, drink that, like, shook me, I feel like shook me to, to bartender of the year through Rick House and everything was the daiquiri. You know, mm-hmm. and it was a time that it was so simple and so easy, and I would do a Diplomatico daiquiri, you know, which is a little against the grain because it was Diplomatico as opposed to a lighter style rum. Um, but, you know, it was so simple, and, and I would read in this book about how Constantino would, you know, no one could figure out why, what he would do to his daiquiris that was different. And Hemingway would, like, sit there and, like, research them and watch them and, and, and you know, just, like, three ingredients. It's rum, lime juice, sugar, shaken. What can you really do different? But for some reason, people loved his daiquiris differently. Um, and what he would do, would he would fill his shaker with half cubed, half crushed ice. Okay. And so it would give this interesting texture in the shake. And to me, it really resonated with me on how much those little details really do matter. Um, and for someone like Hemingway to see it, and, you know, Constantino – he, Constantine, Constantino, he would, he would invent drinks for Hemingway, like the Hemingway daiquiri, because Hemingway was diabetic and couldn't drink raw sugar. You know, okay. so it just, if there was any bar I could sit at right now <laughs> and just pay homage to and, 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 and check it out, it, it would definitely be El Fordita. But that's not, not just right now, that's pretty much any time up until the moment I sit at that bar. Always, yeah. <laughs> 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 no worries. I mean, actually, um, I was talking to Tom Dyer on the last big interview that I did, and yeah. um, he was saying that he'd want to go back in time to the Savoy, to the, the American Savoy. bar at the Savoy. So, you know, if I had to say one other bar, I would say the bar, the fictional bar from the the, the restaurant at the end of the universe from the Douglas Adam books. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, like, I like that. Uh, <laughs> cool. Um, and if you could only drink one cocktail for the rest of your life, Nicolata. Okay. <laughs> Dead serious, you know. I don't, I don't tell too many people that. You know, it's <laughs> it's it's a. Uh, I don't ever drink them except for it's my vacation drink. Like whenever mm-hmm. I am turn myself on vacation, I'm like pina colada. It, <laughs> it, it, it like mentally puts me in vacation mode. Um, <laughs> it's 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 my. It's my uh, uh, guilty pleasure, but it's the one thing that I don't think I could live without. Like yeah. if I had that one for the rest of my life. It would make me happy if I had that one for the rest of my life. And guess what? That is Tom Dyer's <laughs> one drink. <laughs> the perfect yeah. drink. Tom. <laughs> we need to get you guys together. You need a project. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, go Tom. Yeah, That's I'm happy cool. to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> no, when I said that I was talking to you today, he was like, when can I come back? <laughs> so uh yeah <laughs> that's cool <laughs> um so yeah i mean any sort of tips that you would give to a bartender if you could give one tip to a new bartender what's the first thing don't let anybody limit what you think you can do with this career right now is a time that we can do anything mm-hmm. and i'm trying to prove that in a big way. And right now, you know, for a long time, it, you know, it, it, it is a service industry, mm-hmm. but it's not always a service industry. It isn't. And it doesn't always have to be. To me, it's the people that find the balance of it all that are going to really lead this. And, 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 and literally, you, could, you can take this profession to space. Seriously. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and... And and run with it, you know. So don't ever be limited by anybody. Any any it, what you think you can do with it, what other people think you can do with it. Right now is our time. It's the bar industry's time. Celebrity chefs had their chance ten years ago, fifteen years. <laughs> ago. They did it. They didn't just have the chance. They they took control. Now it's our time. So yeah, of course. And I mean that's that's one of the things that we're kind of hoping will spill across a bit into the UK because we at the moment bartending over here. You've got the great centers you know you've got some amazing bars now in manchester you've got great bars in leeds obviously london and birmingham and the big cities but not if you go into a regular kind of pub bar and you ask them for an old-fashioned they're going to look at you like what the hell is that 
Well, you know, that's that's still that's still pretty prevalent um, in the non-metropolitan areas mm-hmm. of the United States. Um, and my consulting company, Unlimited Liabilities, that's we've been taking ourselves out of the metropolitan metropolitan areas and actually focusing on getting into the spots that aren't because yeah. to me that's where the real foundations of all this are, are built. Um, in our places like Quincy, Illinois or or you know, middle of nowhere, Alaska. Um, sometimes, you know, and, and so trying to dig into those. But you guys are, you know, um, it's definitely a revolution and it's it's happening and it's just uh, you know in ten years I don't think uh, I don't think there'll be very there'll be very few bartenders that don't know how to make a proper old fashioned in ten years you know with or without cherry with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or without cherry <laughs> no I, I I do agree and I think uh, I think kind of over here at least the the kind of way in is maybe like the gastro pub movement yeah. which is the where you're kind of getting a lot more home cooked and a lot more care taken with the food and maybe the next step with that is to to make the the cocktails match you know um and over here as well we've we've got people like heston blumenthal who i don't know if you guys have heard of in the states too much but he does a lot of molecular uh, gastronomy stuff and playing with playing with tastes and textures and that sort of thing and i'm hoping that we can kind of spill that across into the bartending world a little. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, um, you know, it's interesting because gastronomy, it almost seems like it's taken a step back a little bit mm-hmm. or dynamically changed. Um, almost like the, 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 the gastronomy that's kind of, at least in San Francisco, you started seeing the things that were overly complicated to do, uh, uh, kind of not necessarily prevalently done too much, but the things that were easy to upkeep, like dehydrated mm-hmm. bitters and stuff like that, uh, uh, very much still done. But it's I just it's interesting. I've seen a very much a movement, especially in California, to where I mean, you went from everybody going doing the crazy, crazy gastronomy stuff, you know. Uh, and don't get me wrong, you still have places like Aviary in in Chicago doing that, but yeah, crazy, crazy gastronomy. Uh, and then now everything's kind of backed up to where people are doing as simple as possible and trying <laughs> to make it taste as good. You know, there's there's great bar programs now. They're only doing like three ingredient cocktails or basic ingredients. Okay, uh, trying to knock it out of the ballpark. So it's really interesting to see dynamically how that's happening and seeing how vodka is coming back into play too. Right. You know, okay. It was such a thing that mixologists wouldn't touch for a while, <laughs> but now everybody's kind of going, oh, well, you know, we can't really run away from it any longer. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're actually trying to do is um, the the nightclub that I work in with my partner, um, they're kind of an 80s thing, so it's very retro, and, and it's very much kind of the standard, you know, sex on the beach, uh, woo-woos, all that kind of stuff, and I'm just trying to get a sours in there, you know what I mean? Just, <laughs> you know, like an amaretto sours and a whiskey sours. And, <laughs> you, know, and, you know what's interesting about that, too, is, you know, like places in L.A., you started seeing people um, like Pablo Moy and stuff who were taking those same cocktails, like the sex, with the sex on the beaches and stuff like that, and then remaking them as best as they could down here. Uh, it's just interesting to see how the dynamics of you see things. It's very much circular on where they are. Yeah, of course. And, how they do it. <laughs> and the fact that they go from being something that you won't touch to then someone remaking to being as craft as possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that'd be weird. Like a really craft sex on the beach. I'm gonna have to play with that now. <laughs> you put the idea in my head. Well, if I remember correctly, he did something in a syringe. He did a sex on the beach with some kind of foam in a syringe. Okay. Uh, still utilizing the same kind of flavors. Might have deconstructed it, but it's just uh, very, very interesting to me to see that. <laughs> yeah. Happen. Now that you, sounds. Sorry? Question for you: did yeah. the, Does the '80s? Now, beyond the drinks and stuff, does the 80s music concept thing work for you guys in your nightclub real well, where you're at? Oh, yeah, it's really good because it gets the older crowd in the city. It's the only place. Uh, There's a lot of um, bars around that have the decor. Yeah. But the majority of them will also play 90s and 2000s and party tunes and stuff all night. Whereas um, at this one, because my partner is really passionate about the 80s, she keeps it. And it feels like you're in the 80s there. And it kind well, of works with the cocktail movie. And, and you know, we're, we're introducing flair with the other bartenders and, and that sort of thing now as well. You no, know, it's it's one of those... It's interesting because you say that because I feel like there's 
for some reason right now, generationally, the 80s, no matter where you're at, is very popular and people love it. Yeah, yeah. You know, everybody wants to belch out Bon Jovi. Yeah, exactly. They closed down the 70s bar in town, uh, so we're kind of taking that over as well. You know, we're going to have the upstairs <laughs> bar is going to be 70s. <laughs> it's, it's a natural progression. Yeah, no, it's cool. But, I mean, the thing is, everyone comes in and you know it's not – nobody's going to have a fight in a bar with Queen playing. <laughs> that's that's the difference. You can't fight with Kylie Minogue. And <laughs> but if a fight does happen, it's going to be a great fight. It is, and it's going to be well <laughs> choreographed, and it's going to look amazing. Um, yeah. Oh, one one last question, actually, for you from my my sort of list of standards is uh, who were your influences other than obviously Tom Cruise, which you uh, you said was your main one. Yeah, I mean Tom Cruise. That was a uh, that was a. Uh such an important movie for me <laughs> and I've got some announcements coming out that will concern some of that stuff later too which is kind of cool so stay tuned um, <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, it's weird you know um, during different periods I definitely had different during my mixology stuff period you know I was definitely looking at Dale DeGroff and, and, and his stuff uh, and then going into Tobin Ellis, I used to really look up to, I mean, I still, Tobin Ellis is a legend to me. You know, he was one of the original guys that was doing flair and, and kind of mm -hmm. making it that thing and, and uh, uh, loved Tobin Ellis. Um, and then there's, there's some, you know, some random people that were kind of like in my life that kind of like stuck out, you know, like I remember a guy named Brooks from Hole in the Wall that were, you know, were people that were like old school bartenders that will always stand out in my head as people that there was something that they did that inspired me or something that I did that I saw that was a passion, you know. Uh, I've always been intrigued by alcohol and bars because, you know, one, you'll see people spend their entire lives behind bars and, 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 and there's a passion there. Even even if they seem bitter, there's something else there, you know. <laughs> and you gotta see past it. And then also, you know, the even the the search of what alcohol is. You know, historically, alcohol is derivative for water of life. Whiskey's Gaelic for water of life. All of this was always been a search for mankind. And and for me, it's just culturally and historically significant. And I, I feel like there's a lot of passion behind everything. You know, it's like every time I look at a bottle, you know. Whether it's a, a cheap bottle of crap or it's a <laughs> it's a really beautiful, expensive vintage bottle of something, there's some kind of passion there in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's a passion to make money or to create a good product or to do something, um, and I like finding that. I like discovering it, and I like I like the medium of alcohol as man's art form. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, one of the things that sort of reminded me to ask you that is uh, one of my big influences from when I started, flaring especially. Uh, there's a guy called Scott Young, and he said to say hi to you <laughs> when I was on the call. So. <laughs> you know Scott? <laughs> uh, he's doing some really cool stuff. Um, uh, I, I pay attention to a little bit of what he's doing, but he's, you know, what I like about Scott is that he's very much... Um, uh, um, I have a lot of respect for the people that are focused on the education and mm. trying to elevate others in this industry because uh, out of so many people in this industry that are successful, there's a lot of people that unfortunately don't take the time to properly try to guide the others. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Scott really, really kicks a lot of ass at doing that. And I love that he has that passion to educate and to uh, inspire. Uh, so keep on rocking, Scott. Yeah, it was definitely it was his uh, VHS videos that uh, taught me to flare when I first started. It, it, he's he's killer, man. He's 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 killer. He's got some. You know, he's one of the one of the. There's visionaries in this industry, and I feel like he's one of them. Yeah, definitely. Cool, man. So, I mean, uh, that's pretty much everything I've got to ask you. Is there anything else you want to kind of uh, mention? Anything that you? When, where I, can people find you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you find me on Twitter. It's at Russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L -L underscore Davis, D-A-V-I-S. Um, my Facebook, Mixologist Russell Davis. Um, but I would just say uh, just stay tuned because i got some really major announcements with some really big things, some mind-blowing stuff, even beyond space. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just got to pay attention. I wish I could talk about it now, but doing some really <laughs> exciting things and uh, – Hopefully, I can I can make uh, I can make everyone just be even prouder about their profession of being a, a bartender or a mixologist. Awesome.
Well, thank you so much for being with us and having thank a chat. <laughs> yeah, man. If you ever need anything, you let me know. I'll come on anytime. Awesome. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Russell. Absolutely. Take care, David. Cheers, my friend. <laughs>